Uh, now I'd like to introduce John Nichols. He is National Affairs Correspondent for The Nation. He's an astute obs observer of political trends, and his recent books include Dollarocracy, How the Money and Media Election Complex is Destroying America, The S Word, A Short History of an American Tradition, Socialism, People Get Ready, The Fight Against a Jobless Economy and a Citizenless Democracy, and most recently, Horsemen of the Trumpocalypse, a field guide to the most dangerous people in America. John Nichols, take it away. Oh my gosh, we got, everyone has their bits and pieces here. And get adjusted. Well, fantastic, look at you. What a fine, fine bunch of people. I, I was concerned about the Republic until I saw how many people came out on Saturday morning in Boston and I knew it would be all right. <laughs> Not kidding. This is a great group of people and thanks for coming. Uh, as Cole said, I'm John Nichols and I uh, always begin these events by quoting Walt Whitman who said in Song of Myself, I speak the password primeval, I give the sign of democracy. And my faith is that if we speak the password primeval, if we go to our core precepts, if we go back to who we are and who we should be, then we are, of course, gathered as supporters of single-payer, Medicare for all, health care for all, everyone in and no one out. We are gathered in the faith that in a transformative moment in our economy, in our life, as regards communications and work, that every American has a right to free education from the cradle to the grave. Universities should be free of charge, not a place where people build debt. And we believe, we believe that in this country founded in original sin, the permission of human bondage and slavery, the denial of the rights of women and people of color and people of, di of smaller and sometimes dissenting religious traditions, we believe that the American promise will only be realized when every citizen is equally in access of all the wealth and the privilege and the power of this republic when every American when every American is equal in this country. And we believe that we cannot, we cannot separate economic and social justice at home from an economic and social justice vision that is global. We cannot say to the rest of the world, we will take the wealth and the power of this planet and then we will not even distribute it fairly here, but we'll tell you how to do it. No, no, brothers and sisters. We believe in an American relationship with the world that is as an equal partner respecting the rest of the world and promoting the vision that Americans rallied behind at their best more than 200 years ago. We are in opposition to colonialism to imperialism, to kings and concentrated power. We believe that people have a right to self-determination and have a right in peace and economic equality to form countries where they advance justice rather than they simply do our bidding. So where do we stand? How's it looking today on this Saturday morning? Well, you gathered two years ago after the 2016 election. The great challenge was keeping people's jaws up because so many people were walking around with their jaw hanging down. They were like, hold it, this is the country I live in? Now many of you I know are sophisticated people, great observers over a long period of time, and so you were not as shocked as some people were. You knew that racism and sexism Militarism, 
inequality, that these were realities of our country. You just maybe didn't know that it could prevail in an election, that it could prevail in an election nationwide. And so two years ago was a very jarring moment. You've asked me to come today to talk to you a little bit about the election we just had. I quoted Whitman a moment ago. Walt Whitman had a wonderful poem about the 1884 election in which he said, more powerful than Niagara, more rock solid than the mountains. The most powerful creation of these United States is the great ballot shower, that flood of ballots that falls like snowflakes in early November and tells us who we are. Well, we had a great ballot shower on November 6th. It was such a big storm, they're still counting the Still clearing away. And of course, as with any storm, they don't always do the job right. You know that sometimes they don't clear the streets well. Sometimes they don't get there and get the transportation up. And so I just want to point out that if we want to find the examples of a failed democracy, we do not have to go that far. We don't have to travel overseas. If we get down to Georgia, we will see it. The fact of the matter is Stacey Abrams yesterday said, you know, that essentially she's suspending her campaign. She didn't concede because you shouldn't concede in a situation where the rules were rigged against you from the start. Right. Andrew Gillum, a great hope for those of us who, who watch the transformational politics of our time and believe in the possibility that states which were once a part of the Confederacy could be led by African Americans. Andrew Gillum, who ran a brilliant and beautiful campaign in Florida, appears to have fallen short by a handful of votes. Again, in a state where the voting systems are in such chaos, such crisis, that we will never fully know the results of that election because the government itself stands in the way of a fair and accurate count. Now, we can look around the country and found deeply disappointing results, and we should never failed to acknowledge them. But if we acknowledge that up front, if we acknowledge the barriers that were thrown in our way, in the way of a just and equitable result, in a way of a democratic result that might in some way reflect the will of the great mass of Americans, if we understand that, if we understand that just a month before the election, in the same week, we heard that the Secretary of State of Georgia was going to put on hold the ballot applications, the registration applications of more than 50,000 people, the overwhelming majority of them African Americans. And we heard that same week that in North Dakota, where there was a close Senate race, that they had approved a change in the registration laws so that Native Americans, Native Americans when they brought their ID to the polls, a poll that had worked in the primary election didn't work in the November election because you had to have a street address and Native Americans living in rural reservations don't have street addresses. They literally changed the rule from the primary to the general election to deny the franchise to Native Americans. And then if we look to Dodge City, Kansas, we say here we have a majority Latino community where a month before the election they moved the only polling place in a community of 20,000 people a mile out of town, a mile beyond the last bus line. Oh, I know. You can't, you, people, I love you for that reaction. You're like, no, come on. <laughs> right? This is just absurd. That we, know, we, we recount these things because we want you to know what they threw in the way of democracy. And we want you to remember that they did it to African Americans, to Native Americans, and to Latinos. Voter suppression is real, and it is used to deny the franchise to anyone who might stand in the way of economic and social justice. We put these connections together because we know that if you hear that word voter suppression, you better run to stand in solidarity with whoever's being suppressed because I guarantee you, they won't stop at that community. They won't stop with one group of people. So all this thrown our way, my goodness, Mr. Nichols, I thought you were supposed to make us feel good. <laughs> and all we're hearing about is all these barriers. But I tell you this because it's important for you to understand they did all of this because of their fear, because they sensed that there was a possibility that there might be a blue wave coming 
toward their, toward their barriers, to their, their power. And then here's where it gets interesting, brothers and sisters, because we have media in this country that doesn't know how to cover politics. No, oh, I know it, man. This is a more bizarre thing. If you, if you tuned in, and I know that we do this now because we have made politics into a spectator sport, and we, it is just like watching the Super Bowl. On Tuesday night, on election night, we get there. I got the bowl of popcorn. We got our six-pack or some of us more. And we're there, and we are ready to watch this incredible sporting event. And, they, and if you watch it, I promise you, if you tune in the Super Bowl or if you tune in election night, you will not be able to tell the distinction. There are two teams, and they've got graphics and people coming in and watching, well, this team moved here across North Carolina, and then this team moved back. Oh, it's, all, it's just like sports, except for, of course, it's our life. Well, if you tuned in on Tuesday night, right, and you're watching Steve Kornacki and that King guy on CNN and all these people, they were like, well, we just got a couple precincts in from uh, South Carolina, and it looks like the Democrats aren't going to do as well as expected. And um, so it looks like everything's going to kind of go to hell. And, and it's like 8.30 at night, and you're like, my popcorn's, it's, I haven't even eaten my popcorn yet. And, and if you went to bed with a little tear in your eye, and you kind of like, I don't want to hear anymore. I, I remember how this turned out in 2016. You know, staying up late's not good. There's nothing healthy about it. <laughs> Just gets worse every hour. No, but you see, here's the interesting thing. We evolve. People evolve. Countries evolve. And if you stayed up late enough on that Tuesday night, good things started to happen. Amazing things started to happen. I comment for BBC on elections. And so I did it until midnight. And then I was doing Amy Goodman's show for about an hour afterwards. And we're just, yes, you can applaud Amy Goodman. Please do. What would we do without her? My goodness. So I do an Amy Goodman show after that, and, and then it's about 1 a.m., and, and you know what? The results were just okay at that point, and I said to myself, well, you know, I'll probably I'll write a little bit, because that's what I do to kind of bring myself out of my, my more difficult moments, right? And a friend of mine called and said, I live in Madison, Wisconsin. A friend of mine called and said, well, you better get down to this victory party for the Democrats, because something's happening. And I said, I said, no, 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 I know how the maps work. I'm a pundit. <laughs> I looked at these results so far. It looks like Scott Walker is going to get reelected. The anti-labor, anti-voting rights, crack down on limit public education, limit public services. Literally, the face of the right-wing advancement in this country. The guy who said, they say, gave Donald Trump the idea for how Donald Trump would be Donald Trump. Although I... I'm more generous to Walker than that. I believe that Trump is a unique figure. But Scott Walker, they said, you know, he might get beat. I said, no, no, it won't happen. I looked at the map. The rural areas are still out. There's areas where he's going to win. He's going to get reelected. It'll be narrow, but he isn't going to be beaten. And they said, no, no, no. They just told us there were 42,000 uncounted so far absentee ballots and early voting ballots from the inner city of Milwaukee. And I thought to myself, we have had so many times where the late result was 42,000 ballots from some place where those who perhaps are not dispossessed, perhaps who haven't been left on the sidelines of power. But suddenly, here we had this amazing moment, 42,000 ballots from the inner city, mostly, of Milwaukee, overwhelmingly African-American, overwhelmingly working class, and low-income folks. And they counted those ballots. And I did get down to that party. And I want to tell you something. If you haven't had this experience, it's worth seeking out. Because when you are in a room where for eight years people have marched and struggled and occupied a capital and done everything in their power to fight against a governor who is assaulting labor rights and civil rights and human rights, that fought it at every turn and been defeated again and again and again, when the announcement comes that that governor has been defeated the governor who attacked public education was defeated by a teacher. And 
When that announcement is made by the newly elected 31-year-old community activist, civil rights activist, first African-American Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes, named after Nelson Mandela, coming to that stage and saying they said this day would never come. Well, we are here. Brothers and sisters, it wasn't that bad a night. So I decided I better stay up a little later. And you know what? We didn't have a blue wave. We had a slow wave. And every few days, every few hours, it gets a little bit better. Democrats had a constitutional result, a constitutional result on November 6th. Constitutional result is one of those moments where the best instincts of the founders, imperfect men, but who's established a system of separated powers, the best instincts of the founders are realized. We had a constitutional result in that after two years with no checks and balances on Donald Trump and on Trumpism itself, the Congress of the United States had shifted so that you now have genuinely separated powers. You have an entity that can say no to the President of the United States. You have an entity that can challenge the President. Some people say to me, well, yeah, but it wasn't that big a majority. I mean, I don't really care. <laughs> you give me one seat on the side of, of investigations, inquiry, challenges, I'm pretty good with that. And you give me one seat, now it's going to turn out to be about a 40-seat pickup, the largest pickup by Democrats in an election since Watergate. But you give me a majority that puts Maxine Waters in charge of the committee overseeing the Trump family finances. I believe I'm satisfied with that election result. Oh, and as Brother Cole has told us, we had so many, so many committee chairs coming up, people who have been at the heart and center of economic and social justice struggles. Jerry Nadler is the new head of the Judiciary Committee that's, that's really the key committee, the committee that will, I think, in so many ways, give Donald Trump a, a bit of a wake-up call. And uh, Jerry Nadler, I want you to understand who the new chair of the Judiciary Committee is. Jerry Nadler is a New Yorker, um, and on the day that Donald Trump, one month or one week after the election uh, swearing in in 2017, announced the Muslim ban, which was a Muslim ban, but only a ban on some Muslims, mind you. When uh, Donald Trump announced that, Jerry Nadler lives on the west side of New York. He went down the elevator in his building. I asked him, I, I said, how'd you do this? He said, I hailed a cab. He went out and got to the, the front door, hailed a cab, and the cab took him to JFK Airport, where he said, as soon as I heard that Muslim ban was coming, I knew there are planes arriving right now from around the world at JFK, and I wanted to be there as a member of Congress to put myself between those who would seize these people coming to this country and try to imprison them, impound them, limit them from coming. I wanted to stand in solidarity at their side. And Jerry Nadler got people who were grabbed at that airport freed that day and got them home to their homes in New York City. That is the new chairman of the Judiciary Committee of the United States Congress. I don't have a lot of time, so let me just tell you a couple other good things. In the race for the Senate, you know, Democrats didn't take the Senate. And I think everybody's like, oh, bummer, didn't take the Senate. Well, you realize that taking the Senate was like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and then climbing it again the same day. I, they, they, we had this overwhelming majority of seats that were up were Democratic-held seats. So by the nature of it, it's going to be very difficult. But this is an important thing to, to remember. On election night, Democrats are in this playoff, I should say, since then, of the of the... 33 seats that have been called so far. We still have a seat in Mississippi in play, and that's one to watch. And then we also have the, the ongoing Florida fight. But of the 33 seats that have been called so far, Democrats won 22 of the seats. 22 of 33. I mean, I don't know about you. I, I went into journalism, so I didn't have to do math. But I believe that's actually a pretty good result. 
And then here's the interesting part about it, too. They also elected two independents uh, who side with and caucus with the Democrats, including this fellow, the first winner of the night, declared by the most overwhelming margin, a fellow from Vermont named Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and so with all due respect, the Senate race has produced a far less troubling result. And here's one other interesting element of the Senate race is worthy of note. Uh, of the Democrats who were defeated, it is true that some Democrats were defeated. Joe Donnelly was defeated in Indiana. Joe Donnelly went up with TV ads saying, I will never do Medicare for all. How did that, how did that work out for you, Joe Donnelly? It, and Claire McCaskill got beat in, in Missouri. And Claire McCaskill said, you kept making a big deal. Oh, I'm not one of those Bernie Kratz. I'm not one of those people on the left. I'm really, well, she got beat. How did that work out for you? And, and, and I'm sorry to say, Heidi Heitkamp, who I think is a better soul, Heidi did get beat up in, in North Dakota, but with all due respect, North Dakota is not easy. And so those are the three that got beat, but who won? In my state of Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin got reelected. Oh yeah, yeah, you may applaud that. This is the first out lesbian ever elected to the US Congress and then to the US Senate. She was the number one targeted Democratic incumbent in 2018, they spent tens of millions of dollars. The Koch brothers came in with massive wall-to-wall -wall advertising against her. She was attacked for being an all-in, 100% supporter of Medicare for All, and she stood in those debates and she said, I favor this because this is a better system for America. And in a battleground state that voted for Trump in 2016, Tammy Baldwin was reelected as a supporter of labor rights, civil rights, human rights, as somebody who actually joined in the marches and occupations of the Capitol in 2011. She was reelected by a 55-45 margin. It was a landslide victory. <laughs> so don't let anybody tell you it's some sort of centrist win here. And then. Let me take you one last place before we depart to your wonderful questions. And that's gonna be the best part of this, by the way. But let me give you one last little bit of information. The big news was at the federal level. Oh, I love, by the way, how this place is filling up. Look at all these people coming here. Fantastic. Because they know, you know, it's like success breeds, you know, this sense of connection. Like, wow, okay, we're doing okay. Let's go, to the, let's go down to the Peace Action Organized event which sponsored by all these good people. So let me tell you this. The big, yeah, come up front, brothers and sisters. It's an altar call later. Um, and so let me tell you about the states, because the states is where the action is. Donald Trump was elected president of the United States, not by the majority of the American people. 54% of people voted against him in 2016. He lost the popular vote by 3 million votes. We are the one country in the world where you can lose the popular vote and become president. And he, and he became president because of a bastardization of our system, the electoral college created in slavery times by those who sought to keep people from having power, understand the roots of the electoral college. One great historian of the electoral college said, if you knew why the electoral college existed, you would never again even mention its name because it is such a dark force within our society. That's the only reason Donald Trump is president. And Donald Trump is president because three states, oh, and this is hard for me to say, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania narrowly supported him. About 75,000 votes in those three states. Had they gone the other way, Donald Trump wouldn't have been president of the United States. So that's the key. That's why Trump is president of the United States, because of three states. Well, on Tuesday, November 6, those three states elected, each one elected a governor, and each one elected a senator. And they were very competitive races. They had real fights, credible candidates in all these races. And in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, Democrats won every single Senate race and every single gubernatorial race. And in Wisconsin and Michigan, they won every major statewide race on the ballot. Mr. Trump, there is a message coming to you from out in the middle of America, and that is the people that made you president by that incredibly narrow margin have decided that they want to check and balance your presidency. He lost every one of those states on Tuesday, November 6th. <laughs> but Democrats took the Democrats also took seven governorships. 38 million people who at the start of Trump's presidency were under Republican governors are now under 
Democratic governors. That is an amazing transformation. They also, and this is the big deal, the people down those ballots. You know, we only look, our media can't tell us about all the stuff that's happening. Do you know the new lieutenant governors, number two person in government in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Illinois, three key states that switched their governorships, are African Americans. One of them's a, yes, one of them's a community organizer. One of them's the former director of MoveOn.org's New York office. And then the other is the th leading advocate in Illinois for criminal justice reform for juveniles. These are the new number two people in these states. In my state of Wisconsin, the new attorney general was a former federal prosecutor who gave up being a federal prosecutor so that he could fight voting rights cases. The new attorney general of Michigan is an out lesbian who appeared in all of her campaign materials with her wife and her children and said from the start of the campaign, do not tell me that you've got to have a penis to know how to govern and do things right. She said it in her own ads. And Dana Nessel didn't get elected because of that. She got elected because she had spent a lifetime as a civil rights lawyer in Detroit. And the first community that rallied to her was the African-American community in Detroit because they said, she's had our back for decades. We're going to have her back in this election, brothers and sisters. You cannot be disappointed by what we're seeing. My goodness, the state of Kansas. The state of Kansas just elected a Democratic governor and sent, an, and sent a Native American lesbian to Congress. That's the state of Kansas that just did that. So let me close off, and I promise you, now we go to these questions, but let me just tell you one other thing. Brothers and sisters, wasn't it kind of good when you saw those pictures come out of Washington, D.C. this last week and we saw sitting at that table taking selfies because they're young enough to know how to take a selfie. <laughs> Sorry, these committee chairmen in Congress that don't know how the Internet works. Here we got these four young women sitting there. Ayanna Presley coming out of the Boston area. Rashida Tlaib, a Muslim Palestinian American coming out of Detroit. <laughs> Ilhan Omar, Ilhan Omar, eight years in a Somali refugee camp, a refugee. Now an American legislator going to the Congress of the United States telling her constituents, we don't send refugees back from Minneapolis, we send them to Congress. <laughs> oh, and brothers and sisters, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Oh my goodness me. I love it when they attack her. I do because they say, oh, she has a nice coat. She must, maybe she's not as poor as she says she is or something. And I thought to myself, you know what? I've known poor and working class people. When they go to do something important, unlike the wealthy, who say, oh, I can wear whatever, I can do whatever I want. When poor and working class people go to a position of power, they do find their best coat. They do dress up. They do try to look good because they know they are coming into the corridors of power and they want to be treated seriously. And those who attack Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for her clothing, for her statements, for everything they can find to attack her, brothers and sisters, know that this is the greatest measure of our victory. This is the greatest measure of our victory. They are terrified that a proud democratic socialist is coming to the Congress of the United States to explain that it is possible, to explain not merely to Republicans but to Democrats, that it is possible to have single-payer Medicare for all, that it is possible to have education for all, that it, is that it is possible to dial down these military budgets, to dial down imperialism, to close bases and bring troops back home. Brothers and sisters, if you look at the platform that she ran on in her district, it is more detailed than the Democratic Party's platform, and it is more focused not just on domestic policy, but foreign policy as well. We have elected a group of young women and a couple of young men 
We have elected a group of young people to Congress. They are still a minority. There's no question of that. But my goodness, we have people marching into that Congress to stand up for economic and social justice and for peace at a level we have not had in generations. And anybody who tells me that that wasn't a sufficient election for them, I will tell you, you are just not gracious. I am so excited about the transformation that is coming. And I believe that what happened on November 6th is not the end of anything. It is simply a beginning because when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez takes that oath, when Ilhan Omar takes that oath on the Quran, when these people step up and they start speaking from the floor of Congress, I believe that we will all be listening to them and people we don't even know will be listening to them. And slowly but surely we will start to realize there is an alternative to neocolonialism. There is an alternative to neoconservatism. There is an alternative to neoliberalism. There there is an alternative to imperialism. There is an alternative to economic and social justice. And it is rising in America because we just had the highest turnout election in 104 years. And when you have a high turnout election, the great mass of people come and vote. And if they get over those barriers that are put in their way, they will elect young women to lead us out of the wilderness. Solidarity, brothers and sisters. I sure can. I'll repeat your question. What does your t-shirt say or your sweatshirt? It says Veterans Peace Team. You know, we, my brother, we just celebrated the armistice. What a beautiful day that was. How old are you, brother? 75. 75. I, yeah, I want to elect a young man like you. All right. Um, hey, brothers and sisters, I, I, this is a great place to begin and so well, so well stated. Um, here's a little factoid I like to let people understand. You know, maybe get a sense of the, there is a generational moment here. You need to understand, if you drive down the street and you pick up every random young person you meet and drive them to the polls, that is the more effective thing than anything else you can do politically because the rising generation is actually on the side of economic and social justice and they know how to use the internet. And so by the nature of the thing, we should be very excited about this youth wave and we should also understand what other sort of subtlety here and I say this as somebody who's getting old by the moment and in fact actually celebrates many of our elders who have led us to play. I was with Noam Chomsky a week and a half ago and, and you know, he's going to turn 90 on December 7th. And the fact of the matter is I will make Noam Chomsky president uh, or maybe not president, maybe an advisor to the president. But the fact of the matter is that guy is ready to, you know, he's going. So here's the deal. Um, it's not about age per se, but it is about how you you know, how you imagine things, how you think about things. And here's an intriguing thing. If Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez decides to run for president in 50 years, she'll be Biden's age. <laughs> you understand? That's how young these people are. <laughs> they really do have a new generation here. And we have, to, we have to embrace and celebrate. I think that Nancy Pelosi will be resistant to some of this. I think it is very vital that the Progressive Caucus and other folks are pushing for an expansion of the leadership team. I, frankly, would be very surprised if Pelosi and Clyburn and Hoyer step down. I don't think that's going to happen in this cycle, and I think they will probably retain power. I may be wrong, and I love being wrong because I get to cover interesting things, but here's the, the bottom line on this, and it's an important thing to understand. If we expand that leadership team and we say, we want some of these younger people like Hakeem Jeffries and others to move up, we begin to... to get that process going. Uh, the deeper problem is with the Democratic Party. We should understand that. It's not, don't personalize it to one individual or one person. We understand. Democratic Party since 1970, or since, I'm sorry, 1944, the end of World War II, made it a perilous decision to be a managerial party rather than a visionary party. And again and again, the party has pulled back from being visionary to be managerial. They have since 1944, 1945, tried to manage the New Deal. Well, the fact is, the New Deal was very good in many ways. It was imperfect in others, but it wasn't the end of the deal. It wasn't the end of it, right? And we are at a moment where we need a new New Deal. And, and I, people say to me, well, we need a green New Deal. I, you know, that's cool, but we need a whole bunch of New Deals. And this is an important thing to understand. Those who seek to keep the Democratic Party on a cautious managerial route because they think that they can be just the alternative to the Republicans are not creating an effective alternative to the Republicans. The effective alternative is a message that in a moment of 
radical globalization, 30 years of globalization largely driven by corporations, in a moment of radical digital change where we are 20 years into a communication revolution where every way in which we communicate is different, in a moment of radical automation change where everything about how we work and how we will work is altering, in a moment of overwhelming climate change where we may only have 12 years in which to save the planet, and in a moment where we still have not addressed racism and sexism and inequality in this country, in a moment such as that, to say, I just want to do a better job of managing the now, is to diminish the reality of the challenge and to avoid the future. And so the Democratic Party has to change radically, and it isn't just about Nancy Pelosi, it is about the deeper fundamental failure of people in the leadership of that party. <laughs> Hey, how are you? Hi. Hey, one more. Um, yeah, if you might be here. Oh, you good? You got it. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of going rock star. You're I going rock star on us here. Yeah. <laughs> I made an adaptation. Um, don't we have to put um, neoliberalism into the mix and oh, yeah. the fact that the Democratic Party, most of the Democratic Party, and a lot of and all of the Republican Party has bought into that? Yeah. So you have to go beyond the managerial. Yeah. Different. Sorry. That's a very good, that's a super great point. Have you made as much, you've said what, you want to, okay. I'll repeat it for sure. And by the way, I want to promise you that this woman who has just come to the microphone is not a plant. I did not put her there. Although she asked the exact right question, do we not have to put neoliberalism into the mix? And in fact, this is at the heart of the matter. Um, I could belabor this for a long time. You're going to have one of the best conferences ever over the next you know, few hours, so we gotta, we gotta move toward that. But let me just tell you that I wasn't, wasn't joking when I said that the crisis goes back to 1944. And I'm not gonna take you through every development along these, these years, but I'll tell you that in 1944, Henry Wallace, the Vice President of the United States, gave a series of speeches in which he said that the fascism that we are about to beat in Germany will still exist in different forms around the world, even though we won that war, and that there is a American fascism. He said that in 1944 at the start of the year, and his message was that economic, economic consolidation, control of the media, control of our politics by wealthy people who sought to manage the political life of our country in their own interest and in the interest of their economic advancement would impose a politics and a governance on this country that would steal the full promise of the defeat of fascism in World War II. And he said this repeatedly. He was challenged by the New York Times. He was challenged by the bosses of the Democratic Party. Finally, at the Democratic Convention in 1944, he was thrown off the ticket, removed as the Vice President of the United States, and replaced with a machine politician who was much friendlier to those in power, and that was Harry Truman. Harry Truman became an okay president on some areas, but the visionary, the view that, that this country had to challenge economic power, had to be in favor of economic democracy, to challenge neoliberalism itself, that was, that was put forward there at that point, and the Democratic Party chose not to do it. And I really want to emphasize to you, I promise you, I'm writing a book on this so I know a little about it. Um, I want you to go back, I, I urge you to go back and read the speech that Henry Wallace gave to the convention in 1944. He said, this is a very significant thing, he said, we're fighting against fascism around the world. And fascism treats people differently because of their race, because of their ethnicity, because of, you know, their economic circumstance. And he said, when we win this war, we in the United States have to address racism. He said that in 1944 to a democratic convention that included segregationists. He said, the women have come in to the factories and gone to the fields. They have won this war for this, for us. We have to address sexism in this country. We have to raise up the condition of women. We have to recognize that we have not treated our immigrants well. We have to, he gave a whole speech in which he said that the connection between economic injustice and racial injustice and religious hatred, these things were real and we had to focus on that because if we didn't, somewhere down the line, you would get a millionaire or a billionaire who would seek to divide us along lines of race and religion and immigrant status. And that person would come to power and they would move this country toward what he warned would be an American fascism. 
And brothers and sisters, when the Democratic Party pushed Henry Wallace aside and pushed people like him aside, they pushed aside a response to the crisis in the moment when we could have gotten ahead of it. Now the crisis is so real, it haunts us at every turn. And our duty today is to fight for a vision that says the Democratic Party must be radically opposed to neoliberalism and to neoconservatism, that it must in fact be a party of economic and social justice and peace, and it must look to these election results from across this country and to recognize that the people who were elected in state after state in those down ballot races, these women coming to our Congress, so many of these people coming in would not be there, would not be there if we accepted a cautious managerial approach. We have to listen to them, we have to move them toward leadership, and we have to look toward the 2020 election campaign for President of the United States, not merely to defeat Donald Trump, but to defeat 75 years of caution and pulled punches and failure and to recognize that it is time finally to organize this country on behalf of an economic and social justice vision, on behalf of a peace vision that can defeat fascism around the world, but can also make sure that fascism never comes and roots in the United States of America. Thank you. Please, thank, please join me in thanking John Nichols. You can read John's writing at The Nation and at The Progressive, and you can, read, you can order his books online. He's, he covers a lot of important issues in his books as well. Uh, so, so please follow up.